professor here at UCI. And today I'll be talking in general about shared ride mobility services. Um, I think I took the program title a little literally um, in terms of innovative proposals. What I'll be talking about in the second half of this presentation is about kind of future work I envision. So in addition to taking questions at the end, I'd love to hear, get some feedback on uh, the ideas I'm proposing. Uh, so I'll be introducing some preliminary terms, motivating the study, and then present, presenting two different studies, the first of which has been um, pretty much completed, and the second one is a, a future study I plan on conducting. Uh, so there's a couple terms here. I'll be referring to mobility on-demand services without shared rides, which is essentially your UberX conventional Lyft um, and taxi services. And also, in some cases, I'll be talking about automated mobility on-demand, which is with fully autonomous vehicles. Um, the second group of services are shared ride MOD services, Uber Pool, Lyft Line, um, Via, and formerly Chariot and Bridge. Uh, I'll get into why I cross those out in a little bit. So this is, can also be related to microtransit, demand response, and transit, and the dial ride problem. But the services I'm talking about are very much on demand. That is, you have a smartphone in your hand, you make a request, and you want to pick up in the next few minutes. Um, and then also, so in transportation, we use the term routes to mean different things. Um, essentially, in this study, I'll be referring to network paths as in the individual links and nodes on an actual road network you use to tra traverse from one point to another. And vehicle routes will refer to um, the sequence of pick up and drop off locations for uh, uh, an autonomous vehicle or, or a regular vehicle in a mobility on demand fleet. So, um, I'm obviously very involved in the field of shared mobility, so we hear about all these great benefits associated with the shared rides aspect of it. From an individual perspective, um, there's reduced travel costs. You essentially split the operational costs um, relative to a non-shared ride fleet, including the fuel and the labor. Um, you can also capture some of the benefits associated with the capital by depreciation cost reduction from having a lower um, fleet, which is in and of itself a benefit for a mobility service provider. Um, compared to providing non-shared ride service. And then from a societal perspective, um, there's this opportunity to reduce the MT, reduce traffic congestion, reduce, reduce um, fuel consumption, as well as decrease harmful emissions. However, um, over the past five years, a couple of the companies that tried to enter this space have went out of business, including Bridge, um, which was a year or two ago, and Chariot, um, basically early this week or last week, um, went out of business. You might have to say, what about Uber, Pool, and Lyft line? Um, these are Uber and Lyft, at least they have value. I don't know if they're making money, but they're considered by other companies. However, at this point, only around 20% of TNC trips are with shared rides. The other 80% are just an individual, uh, one person per one vehicle, in addition to the driver, that is. So what are the challenges? Why are these um, systems struggling? I think the first is that travelers essentially have an aversion to sharing rides, especially with people they don't know. So that's kind of a travel behavior problem. There's also an operational aspect associated with shared, shared ride mobility fleets that are really challenging. So you have this essential trade-off between trying to increase the number of sharing opportunities when you're routing a vehicle or when you're finding paths in a network. But if you're willing to go very far out of the way to pick someone up and you have a rider already in the vehicle, that increases their detour time, which makes them unhappy. Um, and there's this other third factor, which is price. Um, so if you want to get um, more people into your shared ride service, you can drop the price, but if people aren't willing, even at low prices, to um, use shared ride services, then you're going to be moving a lot of people around in the shared ride service, and they're not, not actually going to be sharing rides. There's also all these underlying stochasticity and uncertainties in the system. You don't know when new on-demand traveler requests are going to make the request. You don't really know your link travel times. There's also uncertainty associated with pickup times. Um, in a lot of cases, Uber pool or lift line, you get, you're in the vehicle and you got to pick up another traveler, the driver can't find the traveler, the traveler is just hopping out of the shower and will be down in a few minutes. There's all these challenges that when you kind of address real world problems, it becomes very difficult. And the last thing is, what are the potential policy interventions if we as a society have decided we want more shared rides and to capture all these societal benefits, um, while taking into account equilibrium at the mode choice level, the destination choice level, as well as the route choice level. So kind of my research uh, in the past and going forward is trying to address um, these questions on a number of levels. For, from a travel behavior standpoint, I want to know 
Who is willing to share a ride? Under what circumstances? For what trip purposes? And with whom are they willing to share a ride? So there's some indication that people really don't want to share rides when they're going to work, and they don't want to share rides with certain other types of people. Um, and I guess, you know, from an economic standpoint, how much are they willing to save in order to share rides versus not share rides? And how much are they willing to detour when they're in, in the vehicle to pick up other travelers? From an operational perspective, I'm looking, um, the first study I'm presenting today here is to determine the impact of this, these stochastic terms that I mentioned earlier on the fleet performance. And then the second study is all about designing better pathfinding, network pathfinding and routing algorithms to improve the performance of the, of the fleet. And then lastly, um, I think that these shared ride services have potentially significant impacts on the way roads and other transportation networks and systems are being used. So the first question is, a uh, research question I'm gonna address is, what are the operational efficiency benefits associated with allowing shared rides versus non-shared ride services? And I'll be looking at this result as a function of how far um, travelers, that is the individual travelers, are willing to detour to pick up other travelers. This kind of definition of the shared ride, automated mobility on demand service. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's these travelers want to get picked up in the next two minutes. Um, they <coughs> request a pickup location and a drop off location. I assume they'll always be served, assume they're willing to wait for a long time. Um, let's see here, the fleet is functionally homogeneous. There could be at most two travel requests inside the vehicle at one time. So um, the results I'm showing are pretty promising despite this conservative assumption that you only have two sets of travel requests in at one time, which is the operational strategy that Lyft was using for a while. I'm not sure if they've kind of changed that motto or that strategy. Uh, the fleet size is fixed. The fleet operator has complete control over all the vehicles, um, and they're trying to seek, seek to minimize fleet miles and travel break times. I'm just going to briefly go over the research methodology here. Essentially, I created a simulation in Python um, that is time-driven, so every X seconds I move the vehicle, <coughs> the, their travel speed times delta X to get their uh, change in distance. There's three essential agents. There's the travelers, there's the autonomous vehicles, and there's the fleet operator. And this fleet operator is solving a dynamic stochastic control problem, or not really a control problem, but um, an assignment problem. And I'll be solving this in a rolling horizon fashion. Every 15 seconds I'll be matching users to autonomous vehicles. These autonomous vehicles can either be empty or idle at a certain point in time, or they can be en route to drop off a traveler and then pick up another traveler for the shared ride. This is, these are some of the parameters I used in the simulation. Essentially, I uh, studied the full day with a fleet of 4,000 vehicles. Again, every 15 seconds is when the assignment of ABs to traveler requests is made. Uh, the vehicle speed is five meters per second because that's how slow taxis go in uh, Manhattan. Um, I assume a 15 second drop off time and 45 seconds pickup time. Um, but in future studies, I want to kind of treat these as um, random variables and see their impact on performance, but that's for future work. <coughs> and then here at the bottom, I'm going to keep the fleet size fixed and increase the demand to see how um, well they perform as the demand increases with the fixed fleet size. And then I vary the um, willingness of users to detour right up their way, basically between no detour and 80% detour relative to their shortest path. So the first set of results um, basically says that allowing shared rides increases the in-vehicle travel time of users, which is relatively obvious because um, based on one, one at the top here on the right-hand side means no detour, 1.05 is 5% detour, et cetera. Um, so the bottom blue line here is with no sharing um, in the, <coughs> the in-vehicle travel time is around 10 minutes, whereas if you allow sharing, it increases to around 10 and a half, 11, all the way up to 12, once the demand gets really high, and you start getting more sharing and more detouring to pick up people. However, um, basically the non-shared ride service cannot hand demand levels greater than 30% um, of the Chicago, or the New York City taxi data with a fleet of 4,000 vehicles. Whereas you, where if you allow shared rides, you get a much higher capacity in your system, you can serve a lot more traffic. This is showing similar results here. Um, that allowing shared rides, shared rides decreases the number of fleet miles in your system. Um, so it's 
not entirely obvious here, but basically for the non-shared ride service in blue, there's a linear relationship between the demand and the number of fleet miles, whereas with the non-shared ride service, you have a slightly sublinear relationship between the demand and the number of uh, fleet miles. I think this is due to the economies of density, economies of scale associated with shared ride services. This is kind of the underlying phenomenon that is driving those economies of scales. And that is, as the demand increases in your fixed fleet size, you increase the number of sharing opportunities. As vehicles are traveling from one passenger's origin to their destination, there's a lot likely to be more travelers along that route once the demand increases. So what are the implications of this? Um, I think it's showing there's significant benefits associated with shared reliability on demand services. Smaller fleet sizes can serve um, the same demand relative to non-shared ride. Um, if fewer fleet miles or VMT to serve the same demand, potentially re leading to reductions in congestion, energy use, and emissions. There's also economies of scale and density. That is, the more people you can get into the shared ride service, or to opt into it, the, the more sharing you'll get once you operate the system. So I think these first two things suggest that there might be a role for a policy intervention. Uh, potential carrots include subsidies for shared ride mobility on demand services. So you can think about it as transit agencies um, contracting out some of their services to shared ride fleets, or you could have sticks. Um, that is congestion pricing, higher gas tax, or road user fees, which makes traveling in general more expensive. You can split those costs um, if you're sharing uh, the, few, the increase in fuel or the increase in congestion amongst many travelers. Uh, then the next steps of the study are to incorporate stochasticity into the simulation, but also to incorporate it into the dynamic routing algorithm. Stochasticity and travel time, as well as pickup. So um, based on that first study was motivation for the second one, uh, which focuses on how to more efficiently um, find paths and routes, um, shared ride, ability on demand vehicles in a real network. So quick question, who here has used a shared ride service like Uberpool or LiftLine? Okay, all right, absolutely, 70% of you. Um, so what happens is, Basically, you make a request, it's possible there's other travelers in the vehicle that um, one of them comes to pick you up. And then once you're picked up, um, you might be the next drop off or a drop off in the future. Let's assume you get picked up and you're the only person in the vehicle at this point. The way Uber and Lyft operate now, as far as I can tell, is they calculate the, or they call Google Maps and it calculates the shortest path between where your pickup location is and where your drop off location is. And that'll get you between those two points as quick as possible. What often happens is, as your vehicle is moving towards your destination, new requests enter the system. Um, and either you miss those requests because you're most likely on the limited access highway if you went, uh, if, you're, if it's a long trip, or you're on some high or fast moving arterial road. Um, so you either miss those new requests that come in for your vehicle, or you have to detour back into the main areas where demand is coming from to pick up those travelers resulting in a huge increase in your travel time. Um, I think this is a myopic approach. So from the perspective of a fleet operator, although we don't know exactly where that demand is gonna be once you're picked up at your origin, we have a, they can have a good idea of where demand is going to arise in the network. So why not um, take into consideration the proximity of links in the network to demand in addition to just the short This is kind of a <coughs> graphical perspective of that. So the color, or the darkness of the green represents the, where the demand is likely to be, and then these are the link travel times. So the shortest path, um, if I get to the top left here. This is where you're picked up. Uh, the short, just the shortest travel time is to go backwards a little bit, um, go on a couple arterials, get on your limited access highway, and to your destination as quickly as possible. However, if you're taking into account um, both travel time and proximity to the demand, you want to move from your very slow arterials towards the um, higher capacity, higher speed arterials while you still have some proximity to demand. So as you're moving along this path, um, there's both more demand here, and you can only make a, might only have to make a slight detour back into the high demand areas to pick up new demand while you're moving. 
And this is kind of the same idea on a larger scale for freight transportation. Basically, as you're going from Chicago to Pittsburgh here, um, so actually kind of ignore the travel times. Let's say this is the shortest path, which is to go through um, central Indiana, central Ohio, and go to Pittsburgh. However, you know that there's likely to be some demand in Cleveland um, at some point that might arise that's also going to Pittsburgh. You could take this other path, which takes, which is also a relatively short path, that increases your proximity to new demand requests by way of going through Cleveland. Um, so from, <coughs> no, I thought this was a brilliant new idea. Um, <laughs> but it, this whole idea of taking into account where future demands might arise has been in the freight literature since 2004. Um, it actually hasn't um, kind of gained a lot of popularity, um, but I think in the context of shared mobility in urban areas, I think it has a lot of potential. You can also think of it um, as an inverse hazardous uh, route, goods routing problem. So when nuclear materials or hazardous goods are moved from uh, rural areas into uh, other rural areas and urban areas, basically you have a bi-criterion shortest path where you're trying to minimize the travel time of this hazardous goods being on the road, but you also want to keep it away from large population centers. Whereas the problem I'm suggesting, I, I'm suggesting the suggestion I have is to actually move the shared ride vehicles through the high density areas where the people are actually living. Um, so this is the conventional shortest path problem formulation, which is to minimize travel time, uh, Tij, where Ij is the length, uh, subject to um, some relatively simple constraints. Um, so this is the bi-criterion shortest path algorithm here, um, which basically adds in a new term, which uh, rewards the vehicles for traveling on links that are close to other demand. Um, and this key term, which I've added to the, uh, the travel time term, basically says the more people you have in the vehicle, the more you want to minimize your travel time. So if you have six or seven people, or six or seven other travel requests in the vehicle, you probably want to tend more towards getting the next person to their travel off location rather than trying to find new requests. And at the limit, when your vehicle is at capacity, there's no new opportunities to pick up travelers along the way, so you might as well go fully towards the, the um, shortest path. So um, I haven't done the study yet, but the expected outcome is that vehicles will be signed to different network paths when this proximity to demand is considered. I think limited access highways are less likely to be used um, by these shared ride mobility and demand services, and arterials near high demand or moderate terrain areas are more likely to be used. Um, <coughs> so I have a question for you. What other vehicles typically travel on arterial on arterials with high demand? Don't, don't answer yet. Though. So I want to extend this to the dynamic case, all right? So the formulation I showed is for a static five criteria and shortest path. But as this vehicle starts traject, uh, traversing these links, new requests are going to come about in which decisions are going to be, need to be made whether or not a particular shared ride vehicle needs to detour to pick it up or whether other vehicles can be used to pick it up. Um, so the plan here is to model this as a Markov decision process. The challenge is, um, the state can be quite large in these instances, so I'm going to have to find ways to aggregate the state of the um, overall transportation network. And so what I presented so far is just from the perspective of an individual vehicle moving through the network. Um, but if we think about shared uh, mobility fleets, they have control of multiple vehicles. So you wouldn't want to put all of your vehicles on one or two um, or high density arterials moving from, in this case for the example, or moving from the northern suburbs into the central city. Rather, you'd want to spread them out so that they can cover where the expected demand is likely to be as they move from the faraway suburbs into the um, closer to the center city. Um, so <laughs> I think when I was thinking about this, basically it sounds like bus routes, right? In your transit network design problem, you want to cover the demand. You want to put higher density, higher frequency routes on your high demand materials, and then maybe um, lower frequency um, bus routes on the slightly less uh, high demand areas. And then the last slide here, um, I think this has potentially substantial impacts on networks. So um, kind of the, both how we model transportation networks now, and I think it's a reasonable assumption of how hum humans behave, is that they're always trying to find the shortest path from where they currently are towards their destination. But what I'm suggesting is that um, now people actually might want to 
mobility service providers might actually want to route their fleets near where demand is. Um, and I think that has potentially significant impacts on the use of our existing roads and how we design new roads going forward. Um, and this is just repeating everything I said earlier. Thank you very much. Actually, from a design perspective, um, kind of where are the right breakaway points for you know, a vehicle with capacity of five versus a capacity of ten, taking into account all these spatial temporal distributions of demand. Um, so there's some work that's on obviously like complex ne network uh, characterization of transportation networks and demand. I think we need to actually dig a little bit deeper into looking to um, not only how individual you know, TAZs in a network are correlated, but rather what happens between those two zones. Um, is there also demand in the subzones of where the route is going to happen that are moving towards the same destination? So yeah, I, I agree that's how to model that demand and its impact on how you design these services um, is going to be a real challenge. I have uh, two questions. The real question is on pricing. But the question I want to ask first is this Chris question. Is, um, is there a fundamental difference between demand on a public transit system outside and demand that you're talking about because transit systems are definitely interested where people are, but not really where they're going. At the one end is demand pattern. I think by any, any kind of analysis looking at things like population employment distribution, you may just assume that people live here and work and it must be the same people. And it's not, of course, at all. They're not, they don't care where you go, but the bus is only going one direction or this. In your case, the origin and destination are equally as important. So you just can't look at the distribution of activity which might pick up people, it's also where they're going. So if you have a lot of people going from say a downtown to an airport area on the outside, you're not going to be concerned with dense pickup locations, you're going to be concerned with dense activity centers. Yeah, I, I agree and we're certainly thinking about it from that perspective. I mean, transit agencies probably should be thinking about it from that perspective as well. 
They probably should, but they don't. They don't very much give a fuck about the cell. Which is systems. maybe why private companies with better data teams and AI algorithms might be operating some of these what were formerly bus routes, right? Well, you know, as far as I can tell, transit operators want to work with this, these sort of operations. The problem is public availability of data that limits things. But my question was really on pricing. <coughs> I, don't, I don't think that I was falling asleep. I'm not awake yet. I've never am at this time of day. But um, did you talk about pricing? Because the trade-off of, of pooling has to be a savings in terms of dollar cost if you're going to be foregoing a quicker drive or ride. Yeah, so it's not in the operational models yet. Um, because once you start going, I mean, if, I, again, I don't know how, how ride hailing works because I don't use it at all. But um, once you're going, you know about what your travel time will be and you know the price. Is that true? Right now, yes. So if you're doing a pooled operation, is that also more or less the case? It may be a bigger range on time, it may be a fixed price. That's exactly right. And the range on time is pretty unreliable at this point. For right. But if it, the more you pick up, the slower you go, your price does stay the same? It stays the same. I mean, unless you get off like terrible service, they might give you a refund. But for the most I'm just part, saying, that's that's a bigger problem, it seems, because if you're willing to, assume you don't have a a dominant uh, strategy of either getting there as quick as possible or paying as cheap as possible, yeah. you have that trade off. But it's an uncertainty in terms of uh, of travel time, and it may not be in terms of price. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of questions about how you know Uber and Lyft will change their different services and how new players might come into this market. But you can think about this from two perspectives. Well, who is going to be the one that makes the decision? So it's going to be the user that says, I'm only going to allow you to detour, um, or myself to detour 20%, or will that offer come from the, the fleet provider and then the person has to make the decision? And I think you, as we move in the future, both of those options are possible. Yeah. Mike, I think for Lyft, using Uber, Lyft is distinguished from Uber. And I think Uber will be a share your point is also like the types of transit agency you ask about their hopefulness or willingness to work with these companies. I mean, uh, these problems are not easier because your fleet's so large. Um, and so the way I saw it in the first study is a pretty heuristic myopic approach. It includes some optimization-based tools, but um, once your fleet gets relatively large, um, and once your demand's relatively large, all the problems are challenging. I think if you have scheduled services, you can hopefully provide, provide a little bit more reliability to those people along the route. Uh, but there's kind of a lot of different trade-offs there um, from the perspective of the fleet operator and the potential users. It's, it's not as, I don't know how to put this, like, it's not as easy because the company wants to um, know not only your demand, but uh, the demand of other travelers so that they can price that efficiently and effectively. But yeah, so I'm thinking about it a lot, but it's not clear to me um, all the benefits or the downsides of a lobby schedule. But certainly some companies will offer scheduled services in the future, I think. I think the regular. Yeah. yeah. Well, the scheduled services is, um, you see that in emergency, emergency medical transport as well. Or emergency, emergency, no, sorry, no, no, uh, not, not emergency, non-emergency medical transport, where people are scheduling rides to hospital or doctor's appointments. Um, and that tends to be predominantly scheduled. Yeah. Although, you know, so, so slightly different routing problem, or it's just a, an extension of this where you have some scheduled service, but you want to support the potential for pooling on top of that. It yeah. becomes sort of scheduled and uh, dynamic. You should probably stop taking questions. We're 10 minutes over. Um, if you want to, you can talk to me at the coffee hour. Thank you very much. So let's take a question straight there.